So welcome to all for this first uh, Neuro webinar of 2021. On behalf of the Neuro Marseille team, we wish you a happy new year. I am Ingrid Meucci, the communication manager of Neuro Marseille, and I am delighted to welcome you. Uh, before we begin, here is a quick reminder of the program for this one hour conference. We will begin with a cross presentation of two PhD students. Each will present uh, the thesis of the other. There will be five minutes of questions followed by a presentation by a researcher for 20 minutes and then 50 minutes of questions. Just to remind, um, you can ask your question in the Q&A uh, section or you can also raise your hand. So for today, for this third, fourth edition, we are pleased to welcome Emily, Emily Borlos from Marseille Medical Genetics Lab, who will present Dominica Pilat's thesis on MT5MMP promotes neuroinflammation pathogenic transformation of the amyloid, amyloid precursor protein and synaptic dysfunction in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease in co-direction with Santiago Rivera and Kevin Baranger from INP. Then Dominica Pila, Pilat sorry, from INP would present Emily Bordeaux's uh, thesis on RET syndrome, enterogy, enteric nervous system and therapeutic strategies under the supervision of Jean-Christophe Roux from MMG. Finally, Cédric Morange from IBGM would present his team and his research on genetic programs modifying, modifying the properties of neural stem cells during development. It would be introduced by Pascal Durbeck. Emily, the stage is yours. Thank you, Ingrid, for the introduction. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm glad to present to you Dominica Pilat PhD project, which is entitled MT5MMP promotes both neuroinflammation and pathogenic processing of amyloid precursor protein, key functions in early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, as you may know, Alzheimer's disease is a progressive neurodegenerative disease, and it's the most frequent cause of dementia. It's characterized by loss of neurons, resulting in gross atrophy of the affected regions of the brain. The cause of the pathology is not really clear, clear yet, but it is associated with three main pathological hallmarks, amyloid plaques, neurofibrillary tangles, and since recently, neuroinflammation and synaptic dysfunction. Uh, there are around 35 million people with AD worldwide, and there is no cure for now. During her PhD, Dominica presently focused on the links between amyloidogenesis and neuroinflammation. Amyloid plaque, plaques found in the brain of people with AD are composed of amyloid beta peptides, which form oligomers. This peptide is a result of the cleavage of amyloid precursor protein, APP, by different enzymes. It was shown in vitro that amyloid, be amyloid beta oligomers induces secretion of interleukin-1 beta and neuroinflammation, and that as a vicious circle, neuroinflammation increases production of amyloid beta oligomers. Her team works on matrix metalloproteinases, MMPs, uh, which are enzymes that are modulators of the pericellular micro microenvironment and have an important role in various cell behaviors as cell proliferation, migration, differentiation, and uh, cell death. Most importantly, the team is interested in a specific member of that family called MT5-MMP, which was shown to be implicated in APP cleavage and also in um, interleukin-1 beta-mediated neuroinflammation in the peripheral nervous system. The main aim of uh, Dominica is to evaluate the role of this enzyme MT5 MMP in neuroinflammation, amyloidogenesis, and synaptic activity at early stages of neuronal development. To study Alzheimer's disease, Dominica uses a transgenic mouse model called 
5X FAD model and which express a trunk gene with five AD linked, five ID linked mutations. This model induces the development of amyloid plaques and neuroinflammation. And so here you can see staining of the hippocampus for amyloid beta in red and GFAP in uh, green. We can see that at two months in asymptomatic mice, there's no uh, signs of amyloid plex and no glyosis. In a prodromal stage at four months, which means uh, mice uh, be before the, ap the appearance of uh, cognitive impairment, uh, we can see some amyloid plaques and presence of uh, Gliosis. And in a fully symptomatic mice at six months, we can see a lot of amyloid plaques and gliosis. In order to study the role of uh, MT5 and MT in AD, they generated uh, knockout mice for MT5 and they crossed them with a 5X FAD uh, model to obtain double mutants. So embryos from these four different genotypes, wild type, knockout for MT5, transgenic mice, and uh, double mutants um, are used to make mixed primary neuronal and astrocular culture. And the addition of interleukin-1 beta in culture let us study the response to inflammation, uh, APP metabolism, and also synaptic activity for the different conditions thanks to molecular biology, Western blots, immunochemistry, and electrophysiology. During our PhD, Dominica showed that MT5 deficiency impacts amylo amyloidogenesis, reduces interleukin-1 beta-mediating neuroinflammation, and that MT5 knockout in uh, AD transgenic mice inhibits neuronal hyperactivity and prevents dendritic spine loss. This study at early stage of the pathology shows that uh, this enzyme is a new potential target in uh, pathogenesis of AD. Thanks. I hope, Dominica, that I, I, uh, I talk well about your subject. <laughs> very, very good. Thank, Thank you. you. So I don't know if Ingrid, if I can start sharing the screen, it's gonna be visible right now. Yes. Okay, I will. Let's okay. Yes, it's good. Everybody can see. Um, first of all, sorry for not having this very nice background, but apparently my computer does not allow it. So I'm very happy to say a few words about um, TDG project of uh, Emily, which is about red syndrome and enteric nervous system and therapeutic strategies. And what is red syndrome? Um, red syndrome is a rare a neurodevelopmental genetic disorder that affects almost exclusively girls because it is linked with the mutation on the MC, with a mutation on MECP2 gene that is linked with the chromosome X. And after a period, um, sorry, and the prevalence of this disease is one to 10,000 births. So it's quite for me, um, well, not that, not that rare as it's supposed to be um, in theory. And after a period, period of normal development after six or one year um, later, patients falls into something that it's called developmental stagnation. Uh, and in that period, all the girls' patients are losing all the acquired skills that they got in the period of normal development. So they are losing the hand skills, the speech and social um, ability to interact. And um, afterwards, of course, the, the disease worsens with the, with the loss of motor skills. Um, Together with those um, cognitive decline, uh, there are a few um, other main features that we can pinpoint with the disease. Uh, breathing difficulties or problems with the digestive system. Um, and of course, 
there are no currently there is no uh, current um, cure for the disease nor any other genetic uh, genetic therapy. So how to study sorry can go back. So how to study a uh, red syndrome and how Emily is studying it. So there are two or more uh, animal models that are developed with the different MECP2 gene mutations. And the real clinical model is a female mouse model with the, so it's a heterozygous mouse model with the mutation on this gene. But a uh, male mouse model is used as a model in first intention. And this is the model that Emily is working on. This is a model with the total knockout on the MECP2 uh, gene. Why this model is being used? Because this model has a robust phenotype with the symptoms onset around four weeks and the median survival around 65 uh, days. Uh, whereas the female model is a model with the lame symptoms onset around 12 weeks and which is worth saying with a very um, variability in the phenotype due to a randomized chromosome X inactivation. So what are the main objective of um, Emily's project? So Emily is wondering is, if gastrointestinal dysmotility in red syndrome is caused by the dysfunction of the enteric nervous system. So how she's approaching that um, objective, she's of course using the the mice from the from the null MECP2 total knockout mice. And afterwards, she's just dissecting a small intestine and neurons from that small intestine. And what is worth saying, those neurons are found in the myentrine plexus that provides innervation to muscles of the gut. So then it can actually impact the intestinal motility. And some of her results are actually focused on cholinergic transmission in those neurons. And here by qPCR, she's um, showing that genes that are uh, implicated in that cholinergic transmission here and uh, marked in blue are actually downregulated in that knockout uh, mouse model of red syndrome. That's why probably there's disruption of cholinergic transmission happening. Later, she also checked by the uh, dosage of the protein, the levels of choline and acetylcholine. And as you can see, in knockout mice, there is much more choline and much less acetylcholine in comparison to wild type animal. That's why probably there's also that disruption of cholinergic transmission happening. And her newest um, um, avenue of research, she's actually checking the small intestine contraction after a stimulation. And what she uh, what she noticed, what the preliminary data is saying, is that in the knockout animals, this active, this spontaneous activity is actually disappearing after some time. And that phenomenon can be linked with, the lo with those lower levels of acetylcholine in those knockout animals. And to conclude very briefly, uh, she is, her, her research, her, her, her data is showing very profoundly that in those mice with, uh, with red syndrome, there is disruption of the cholinergic neurotransmission in the enteric nervous system. But she also sees that there is a need for more functional experiments to better understand the physiopathology of, um, of red syndrome. But not unless, not unless there's this research opens an avenue for, for potential targets, new targets for therapy um, that could increase a patient's life quality, awaiting, for example, for uh, future gene therapy that, that is coming. Thank you very much. I hope that everyone could see this presentation. Thank you. Um, sorry for those who, who don't um, actually hear it well or see it well. We don't know why. So we're going to start with the question and answer section. So do not hesitate to ask your, your questions in, in the q and section or raise your hand like this. So I think we have a, a question for Maru Folk.
No. Uh, Pascal, you can talk if you want. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you for this really nice presentation. I have a question for Dominica. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have your double uh, uh, mutant, um, do you uh, observe any um, uh, phenotype uh, during the asymptomatic and presymptomatic period when the mice are two and four months old? And do you increase the disease um, and the, the behavior, the cognitive um, um, capacity of the mice uh, at late stages? So first of all, um, the, the phenotype, like generally, when you look at mice, for example, the MT5 knockout mice lose color because we work on the black mice. And when we knock out MT5, they become brown. But with the double mutants, Alzheimer's disease, MT5 knockout, when you check actually the behavioral response by behavioral testing, for example, X maze test or any other behavioral testing, we see a uh, very much improvement in those animals that, um, that those that should enter the symptomatic phase are actually, Delayed. well, I would like that they behave normally, but we see much improvement behaviorally with the, with the, with the MT5 knockout, but we also see that after analysis of the brain tissue, we see much less of the amyloid plaques and much less of neuroinflammation in the brains of animals with MT5 knockout in the Alzheimer's disease background. And following this question, so uh, my question was, uh, if you take the uh, simple uh, MMP uh, mutant mice, uh, do you see any differences in terms of aging and cognitive, de and cognitive declines? Uh, you mean in the wild type background? Uh, yeah, just in the single MT MMP uh, mutant mice. Yeah, they are... I mean, it, it's it's hard to pinpoint because the difference is not as drastic as you can imagine, like when you knock out one protein globally, but there are some some changes on the like the macroscopic levels. So we, we, of course, didn't study all the organs, for example, but all the um, I think that there are some changes in sy sy synaptogenesis and the and the and the all the like, neurons, not formation, but the uh, overall implication of in, in the brain, how is it working? But we do not see, if you check it by the behavioral testing, we do not see that much of a difference between those mice. But for sure, if you would ask if the MT5 knockout is impacting those animals, yes, of course, they, they are not in as good shape as wild type animals. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have Marie Folk who asked for something. I don't know if you're still here. I don't know. Uh, Dominica, you have another question in... Yes. Are the levels of MT5 MMP increased in the brains of AD patients? Um, and right now I'm stressed because there's this huge study that was in nature in 2015 and they for sure ran the Western plots on the samples from, uh, from the um, patients. And I'm not sure, I would say that yes, but I am not sure. Okay, thank you, Dominica. Emily, you can maybe uh, go with the next one. Um, yes, uh, for the... Anonymous who uh, question if there is a link with an alteration of the vagal transmission. Um, we we can't be sure. We can't really uh, discriminate the impact of uh, nervous central nervous system via via the the vagal transmission and the the enteric nervous system on its own. Um, I, uh, but with uh, our functional technique where we isolate uh, the intestine, we don't have any vagal uh, influx, but only enteric uh, transmission. And so we can see that there is really a uh, dysfunction of the enteric nervous system, but uh, there, there is big 
chance is that there is also a vagal transmission, a dysfunction of the vagal transmission. And you can well, maybe with the second one from Anne Cavano Diaz. Hello. Anne asks uh, what would be the link between the dysfunction of the enteric system and the motor disorders. Uh, we, uh, we are looking at uh, motility disorder, but intestinal motility disorder. So we don't, uh, we don't make a link with uh, motor, motor disorders for now. Uh, but as a, acetylcholine is also implicated in the, in the neuromotor transmission, maybe uh, after we can look at the muscle and, and um, investigate about motor disorder. But for now, we're looking only at uh, gastrointestinal dysmotility. And I think you have a last one for you. And that should be all. Uh, yes, are the levels of, uh, I told in mind. Uh, yes, uh, we only confirm that in the uh, RTQPCR for now, and I'm looking at the protein level, but the uh, vesicular trans, uh, transporter of acetylcholine is, uh, is uh, decreased, uh, the levels are decreased at the mRNA level. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to pass uh, to Pascal Durbeck, which will uh, present Cédric Morange. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, is it OK, uh, Ingrid? Yes. For me, I can see you and I can hear you, but. OK, great. So, um, hello everybody, this is a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Cédric Morange, who is a group leader at the uh, IBDM, uh, working on oral stem cell plasticity. So, uh, Cédric uh, did his PhD at the University of uh, Heidelberg, working on epigenetic mechanisms uh, during development in the team of um, Renato Paro, and then he moved to London as a postdoc fellow in the group of Alex Good at the National Institute for Medical Research. And there he worked on sulfate determination during brain development in Rosophila. Um, there uh, he showed that uh, neural uh, fate determination during brain, brain development is uh, uh, tightly regulated by the sequential expression of uh, transcription factors. And um, these really specific transcription factors are expressed uh, following a tightly regulated temporal sequence. Uh, and in case of fa failure of this mechanism, uh, Cédric could show that cell determination is disturbed and the number of neurons produced during development is affected. Uh, thanks to this work, um, Cédric was really one of the first uh, one to show that uh, and to propose the importance of a temporal regulation of the genetic programs uh, which are important during cell fate determination in the nervous system. Uh, for the last uh, 10 years, he has been a group leader at the IBGM and with his group, he's still studying how this uh, temporal series are used to generate um, neuronal diversity. And uh, recently he has shown a really interesting um, effect of this temporal series is that during development, these programs can be uh, used, uh, co-opted uh, to induce tumor formation and to regulate uh, the cancer cell properties. So now with his team is using this really original model which mimic uh, pediatric cancer in Rosophila to understand how uh, tumors are formed and how they grow uh, in the nervous system. So I think Cédric is to, today is going to present this work. Uh, thank you, Cédric, for your participation to this first uh, 2021 uh, Neurobinar. And uh, the stage is yours, or, or maybe I should say the screen is yours. Cédric. So I can speak now. Um, share my screen. Okay. 
Yes, thank you, Pascal, uh, for your nice uh, introduction. And uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure today to, to present our work to the Neuromarseille community. So as you said, I will, uh, I will, work on, I will uh, present you uh, our work on, uh, on the temporal regulation of neural stem cell uh, proliferative properties. And I will make a first part to um, uh, in, introduce you to what we've done uh, during development, but also, as you, uh, you mentioned, uh, Pascal, how this can be co-opted to, uh, to promote and uh, govern uh, cancer. So, but before I start, I just want to briefly uh, present uh, the institute where I work. So this is uh, the Developmental Biology Institute of Marseille uh, that is composed of uh, 21 uh, groups. And it's located in, uh, on the Lumini campus in this uh, building um, that is, has a, a very poetic name of uh, being called TPR2. Uh, and we are uh, on the last floors here. Uh, it's just been, so this is a, a, a digital image. Uh, this is how it should look like in a, in a few years, but now the first part has, has just been uh, renovated and actually we moved back to the building uh, just yesterday. So, so our labs are still full of uh, carbon, card, cardboard boxes and uh, back uh, we can work again in a very nice and renovated institute. Uh, and also, so, Every uh, team here, we are working on uh, various topics uh, 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 touching uh, development, and we try for most of us to understand development, also to understand uh, uh, pathologies. Uh, so this is uh, our, my team right now. So we are six at the moment. Um, three of them are working with flies. That is that has been so far our. Uh, only uh, model uh, system, but so this is uh, Karin. So Karin is a CNRS scientist and she's been working with me uh, almost from the beginning. So she's been really part of most of the, 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 uh, the stories we've, uh, we've, uh, we've had in the, in the lab. Bruno Iver is an engineer that recently uh, joined the lab. He's also working uh, on the fly. And uh, Fanny is a very talented PhD uh, student working with flies also. And now, since um, a few weeks, we have uh, we are very happy to have uh, Mehdi Saadawi that recently uh, was awarded also a CNRS research position. So he's going to uh, to develop um, the, the the chick embryo model system in the lab together with Lauren, that is an engineer. And um, yeah, we are, I'm very excited by, by this. So as you are. Um, part of the Neuro Marseille community. I guess you, uh, you know a lot about uh, the brain. So this is a, a representation of the human brain here. And as you know, it's composed of billions of uh, neurons. It's very uh, complicated uh, organ. It's uh, the most complicated organ uh, of our body. Uh, and uh, it's composed by also a huge diversity of neurons, neurons of different types. Um, and so in the lab, what we try to understand is to, un is, uh, to understand how is the diversity of neurons uh, regulated throughout uh, development so that at the end you get a functional organs with the correct diversity of neurons, but also the correct uh, proportion of each neuronal uh, type. And so to investigate this, of course, you can, uh, you can use model system uh, like the mouse brain that is uh, a great uh, model system, but still really complicated. I mean, it's uh, still uh, several uh, dozens of uh, millions of neurons. And so we like to, uh, to work on a simpler model, which is the Drosophila model. So maybe you'd be surprised to know that uh, Drosophila, of course, are very small. So this is not uh, the, the right scale here. But it's still composed, uh, the, the Drosophila brain is still composed of about 100,000 neurons. So we think it's, uh, it's, it's quite a lot. And it's still a challenge to understand how are this, uh, this uh, whole diversity of neurons uh, controlled and, and uh, generated during development. So why do we work on Drosophila? So actually Drosophila are uh, very similar to, uh, to us. So for example, and the way they are built and, uh, and uh, generated during development, the, the way uh, tissues are generated, 
can, uh, is very similar to, uh, to the way uh, our tissues are generated. So for example, um, uh, they are, the body uh, is organized by the same uh, family of genes, so the homotic genes along the anteroposterior uh, axis. Uh, you, within uh, the, the body, you have multiple organs, of course, that are very similar to ours. You have a gut, you have a heart, you have uh, muscles that are very similar to, uh, similar to, uh, to um, vertebrate muscles. And also, as I was saying, you have a complex nervous system with a brain here that you can see here. And the um, uh, invertebrate equivalent of the spinal cord, which we call the ventral nerve cord. And so I told you that the brain itself is composed by about uh, 100,000 neurons, so it's much, much less than uh, humans, but still uh, the Drosophila genome com, uh, contains about 15,000 genes, which is actually not so far from the 22,000 genes that we find in humans. And the consequence of this is that 70% of the genes involved in human pathologies exist in flies. So we think that if you can understand what the, the genes are doing in flies, now uh, it can help to uh, understand what they are doing in humans. And so um, uh, Drosophila is a very powerful model organism to, uh, to investigate principles that are conserved throughout evolutions. And uh, this, uh, thanks to this, it has gained six, six Nobel Prize uh, and uh, three on the last 20 years. So our aims in the lab is to understand what are the mechanisms that control the number of neural cell division during uh, brain formation, and uh, also understand how perturbation of these developmental mechanisms can initiate uh, tumorigenesis. So this is the, um, the, the life cycle of a Drosophila. Uh, the Drosophila uh, adult will lay, female will lay an egg, and uh, this egg will form an embryo that will uh, very rapidly in 24 hours develop as a, a larvae. Then you have a period of uh, four days in which the larvae will continuously grow. And once it has grown uh, enough, it will uh, under, undergo uh, metamorphosis. And, and during this, uh, this larval growth, so all the organs for the adult life are, are made. And during metamorphosis, this organ will uh, undergo terminal differentiation and they will become functional and uh, generate the adult life. And so this uh, larval stage is really uh, the, the one that we are most uh, interested in because we think, so this is uh, during this phase that most of the neurons are made uh, as well as most of the, uh, the other organs. And the larvae is really, uh, we think, similar to, uh, uh, to uh, a mammalian worm, if, we, if you want. Uh, all the organs are made during this, uh, this part. And, uh, and they are grown. And so we think that the larval uh, period in insects is somehow comparable to the gestational period in, uh, in mammals. So um, during this uh, larval period, uh, as I was saying, the, 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 the central nervous system is growing and uh, we can see, uh, we can identify uh, in the central nervous system a number of neurostem cells that we call neuroblasts that are asymmetrically uh, dividing neurostem cells, neural progenitors. You can see them in red here. And they will continuously generate neurons uh, throughout larval stages. And here you can see uh, one of these neuroblasts that has made uh, a series of uh, neurons here throughout larval development. So one neuroblast can generate like up to uh, 100, between 60 to 100, 200 neurons, depending on the neuroblast uh, type. So how do, yes, and these neuroblasts, so as you can see them here during larval development, they will generate neurons throughout larval stages. And then uh, during metamorphosis, they will uh, stop dividing and they will differentiate. And in the adult uh, central nervous system, they are gone. So there, there, there is no more neuroblasts here, no more neural stem cells. However, um, we have, um, it is possible to induce uh, mutations and generate uh, neuroblast tumors. And you can see here, we can have uh, tumors that, uh, in which neuroblasts are over proliferating and they will, they will um, cover the, the whole uh, CNS and, and continue dividing during development. And at the end, they will kill uh, the fly. So we think these are really uh, tumors. And it has been shown by uh, transplantation that you can keep these tumors growing for, for months and months. So they, they gain an anonymity self renewing uh, proliferation potential. So what we try to understand in the lab is what controls the, the, the fact that neuroblasts will stop dividing during development. 
and what uh, and how this this um, this um, mechanisms are perturbed during the tumorigenic process such that neuroblasts will now gain an unlimited proliferation potential. So what do we know about this? So as um, um, Pascal was saying, uh, several labs have shown that throughout development, so neuroblasts will divide from embryo to, uh, to early pupil stages. Pupa is a metamorph metamorphic stage. Um, and they will undergo several asymmetric divisions. So that means that we self-renew and generate an intermediate progenitor that we call GMC. And this intermediate progenitor will make one division usually and generates neurons or glia. And as they divide, neuroblasts will generate different types of neurons and glia as they divide from embryonic to uh, larval stages. And as uh, Pascal was saying, so it has been shown that neuroblasts sequentially express trans transcription factors as they divide. Uh, this is shown here. And these transcription factors are responsible for giving a specific identity to the progeny of the neuroblast. So, uh, but what, so what, what we are also shown, what we have also shown is that these factors that are expressed in neuroblast, not only are they responsible for, for ensuring that neuroblast generates different types of neurons as they divide, but they also control uh, and schedule changes in the proliferation properties of these neuroblasts. And for example, we have identified two um, transcriptional switches that are induced by these uh, transcription factors. One is operating in neuroblasts at the end of embryonic stages, and uh, thanks to a transcription factor that is called Castor. And Castor will repress another transcription factor, which is called Dikit, it's a SOX gene, and will activate a uh, grain yield. And this switch is important because it makes the neuroblast competent to continue dividing during larval stages. And if you prevent this switch, for example, if the neuroblast fail to activate when yet, then it will uh, very rapidly stop dividing and not be able to generate the whole uh, set of neurons it has to generate. On the other hand, what we've also identified is another temporal switch induced by this gene here, which is called 7-up. And 7-up will activate uh, an RNA binding protein that is called syncrip and will silence another RNA binding pr protein that is called imp. And why is it important to make this, uh, this uh, switch here, this imp to syncrip switch? It is important because if the neuroblast does not make this switch, then it will never stop uh, dividing. And for example, you can have a neuroblast that is mutant for syncrip or mutant for 7-up. And in this case, it will retain an identity that is similar to uh, the, the, the neuroblast identity that we find during early larval development. And it will not stop dividing during metamorphosis and will continue dividing during uh, adult stages and will continuously uh, generate additional neurons. So what this shows is that this, this temporal, this series of what we call temporal uh, transcription factors is uh, really uh, able to uh, change the properties of neuroblasts as they divide uh, throughout development. And in addition, we found so, some downstream targets of this um, uh, gene regulatory network, uh, transcription factors, and E93, for example, that we use also, I mentioned them because we use them to label uh, uh, neuroblasts uh, throughout uh, development. And it, it gives us an indication of the temporal identity of this neuroblast. So to summarize here, we found that neuroblasts, as they divide during development, they undergo different transcriptional states. We have identified a state that, uh, that uh, um, characterized neuroblasts during embryonic development, a state that characterized neuroblasts during early larval stages. So these are very powerful neuroblasts, they divide a lot. And the state that characterized neuroblasts during late larval stages. And this uh, stage is, is induced by the expression of syncrep, and it makes neuroblasts ra rapidly stop dividing and being competent to undergo uh, differentiation during uh, metamorphosis. So you need to reach this stage to, to make sure the neuroblasts will stop dividing by the end of development. So this is important. OK, so this is what we have known during development and, and uh, uh, why, we, why uh, neuroblasts are, in fact, programmed to do a, a limited number of division and uh, to make sure that they differentiate before adulthood. Now, as I was told you, there is a way you can induce tumors. And we are interested to know, OK, what's, what's going wrong in these tumors? Um, in these tumors yes. So how do you induce such tumors? This was shown by different labs uh, some years before. So 
what they have shown is that you can um, uh, uh, inactivate a gene that is called Prospero, and Prospero normally is expressed in the, in the intermediate progenitors here, and it's responsible for inducing the differentiation of this intermediate progenitor. So to make sure that the intermediate progenitor will only give rise, will only divide once to give rise to neurons. Now, if you inactivate Prospero, if you remove Prospero for, from this the neuroblast or the intermediate progenitor, then this one cannot uh, generate neurons and will revert to a neuroblast-like state. And so on the long term, this will induce an amplification of the neuroblast because they will continue divide, dividing and they will generate more neuroblasts at the expense of uh, neurons. And you see an amplification of this uh, neuroblast that you can see here. So normally, uh, uh, so we can inactivate Prospero in six neuroblasts. So this is uh, specific to the Drosophila genetic. It's useful because you know exactly in which neural stem cell you inactivate Prospero. And if you do this, as at the end of larval stages, you see that you have induced an amplification of the neuroblast that you can see uh, here. Now, what is particularly, uh, particularly intriguing here is that these neuroblasts, they do not stop proliferating during metamorphosis. So they do not differentiate, or at least a subset of them can persist into adulthood, as you can see here. So normally in the adult, there is no neuroblast in red. Here, you see that some of them persist in red. And if you look uh, in adults a few days later, so adults that are six days old now, these, are, these ones uh, carry very large tumors that are full of uh, neuroblasts. And these tumors will start to invade um, uh, adjacent tissues. So we try to understand what's going on in these tumors. And so to investigate this question, we used a new uh, technology. Maybe you've heard about it. So it's called single cell uh, transcriptomics. Uh, it was a breakthrough uh, technology of uh, the year, two years ago, and it has uh, really uh, revolutionized uh, developmental biology and also uh, cancer, uh, cancer biology. And for us, it was really a game changer. And so what we did was to take uh, these tumors, dissociate the cells, so these tumors in the adult, these very big tumors in the adult, to dissociate the cells and uh, to uh, generate transcriptome from every single cell of the, of the tumor and see what is the transcription profiles of these cells within the tumor. And so I won't go into the details how it works, but basically at the end you obtain this kind of uh, map uh, in which each dot here is a, is a cell that is uh, placed uh, on this 2D space uh, based on their transcriptional profile. And you can see clusters, and these clusters represent cells that have a similar transcriptional profiles. So you can see here that you have, it looks like you have different type of uh, neuroblasts. So these are all neuroblasts, but uh, some, some of them, uh, so you have different clusters suggesting that they don't have all the same transcriptional profile. And indeed, if you look more carefully, what we find is that these neuroblasts here in the tumor, they all express grainy head. So if you remember, grainy head is expressed in larval neuroblasts. So they are all of that. They all have a larval temporal identity. But some of them express imp, while, which is an early larval uh, temporal identity marker, while some of them will express E93, which is a late larval temporal identity marker. So this suggests that in these tumors, you have a mix of neuroblasts. Some of them have a, an early larval light identity, and some of them have a late, has a late, sorry, have a late larval identity. So I remind you that we have, we are here in tumors that are present in the adults. So we've passed early larval stage since many days. So this was really, uh, really um, intriguing to us. So if we could confirm this by immunostaining. If you can look here, this is an image of an adult tumor here. And you see some of these uh, cells have uh, expressed chinmo and imp, which has a marker for the early uh, larval identity. And the rest of the cells in green here express uh, syncrep. So is it important to have this uh, heterogeneity of uh, neuroblasts within the tumor? Yes, it is, because what we've done is to try to eliminate cells that express uh, imp, uh, so uh, imp and syncrep, the red cells here, imp, sorry, and, and chinmo, the, the red cells here. And if you uh, um, uh, downregulate uh, imp in these tumors, you can see that in fact, uh, all cells will be composed of the green type of cells. All cells will express syncrep. And these cells will all differentiate during metamorphosis and they will not form tumors in the adult. So this suggests that these red cells here are very important to sustain uh, uh, the, 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 the prolif and the growth of the, uh, and to propagate the growth of the tumor 
uh, in an unlimited uh, way. On the other hand, if you inactivate SYNCREP, then all your tumor cells are express imps. They, are all, they will have an identity of, an early, uh, of the early larval stage, and the tumor grows much more rapidly. So at the end, what we could uh, show is that part of this larval uh, temporal patterning system is co-opted during uh, this tumorigenic uh, process and is responsible for uh, generating um, uh, diversity, uh, cellular diversity within this uh, and heterogeneity within these tumors and also for, uh, uh, for um, implementing um, a hierarchical uh, mode of growth in which we will have uh, cells that, are, that have an early level uh, uh, developmental identity uh, that will act as cancer stem cells, so they are required to, uh, to sustain the unlimited growth of the tumor, but also to induce, uh, to generate cells that are committed, more committed into the differentiation pathway, and that will rapidly stop uh, dividing like the syncreep uh, positive cells. So to conclude this, what we've shown is that neurobest tumors are locked into the larval temporal patterning system, and this uh, is responsible for supporting, uh, for inducing continuous growth. This co-opted temporal patterning system induces a hierarchical organization that drives cellular heterogeneity. Uh, cells that are at the top of the, um, this uh, hierarchical organization are cancer stem cell-like cell uh, uh, neuroblasts, and they are defined by the expression of the imp gene 28 uh, module. And what we also found, which is important now for the, for the, the next uh, work that we are doing, is that this uh, tumor cellular composition is stable over time. So we always find uh, the same proportion of cancer stem cell versus more differentiated uh, cells. So this suggests that there is a mechanism that robustly controlled uh, the, the, the composition of the, of the tumor. So what are we, uh, so what, what we're seeing now is that these neuroblast tumors are in fact a, a new and powerful model to investigate really the, the, the principles of tumorigenesis in uh, children. So if I can remind you what are uh, cancer in children, so they are these pediatric cancer, they are often initiated prenatally, so during fetal stages. These tumors exhibit very few uh, mutations and they are uh, genetically stable. And in our case, we only uh, uh, inactivate one single gene to induce these very, uh, uh, very uh, aggressive tumors um, uh, that have a developmental origin. So they are induced during early uh, uh, larval stages. Um, the tumors of the nervous system uh, in, in, uh, in children are more common than in adults, and this suggests that the developing uh, central nervous system is prone to, uh, to cancer formation. And what has been recently uh, shown, so last year, thanks to a single cell analysis uh, also in, uh, in, uh, in pediatric uh, cancers, is that they recapitulate uh, developmental programs, so very similar to what uh, we found. So um, what we are going, we want to address now in the lab is uh, why can't temporal patterning progress normally in these uh, in these tumors, um, and why uh, because of this you have you, you can maintain cancer stem cells. So we want to to know how to uh, to uh, to favor temporal patterning progressions such that you can uh, uh, eliminate all the cancer stem cells. What regulate the proportion of these cancer stem cells in neuroblast tumors? Uh, what are the post transcriptional mechanisms that regulate temporal patterning progression in neuroblast and in uh, tumorigenic neuroblast? So, for this, we have a uh, project uh, uh, working on uh, a microRNA. Uh, and finally, and this is why we are now also trying to work on vertebrate development, is try to understand how is temporal progression controlled in the developing vertebrate CNS and how are aberrant developmental programs regulating tumor growth and uh, uh, cellular heterogeneity, sorry, how are, what did I write? How are so how, try to understand how this developmental program can be aberrantly uh, regulated uh, in uh, tumors also uh, uh, in mammals, so in humans. So I'd like to uh, finish with that. Thanks again, the team. Uh, and and all the the the, the foundation and uh, the people that supported us, uh, and also all our collaborators and uh, the people at the IBDM that makes the research uh, so uh, 
uh, effective, uh, the fly facility, imaging facility, and of course, administration at the Institute. And thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions if you have some. Thank you, Cedric. So do not hesitate to ask questions in the Q&A section or raise your hand. Thank you. Maybe, maybe I can start. Thank you very much, Cedric. C can you hear me, Ingrid? Yes, yes. Great. So I have a question concerning um, heterogeneity in your tumor. So you have shown that the, um, there are uh, cell identity heterogeneity. But I was wondering, um, you have also shown that uh, tumor growth and formation can occur in different areas of the nervous system of the adult uh, drosophila. I was wondering if you observe differences in terms of um, heterogeneity and identity according to the uh, location of the tumor, more in the brain or in the cord or stuff like that. Okay, so... Um... We didn't, uh, we haven't investigated, investigated this in uh, very carefully so far, but what we know uh, is that, um, so we didn't look if you have a tumors that uh, invade another tissue, whether it will change its uh, heterogeneity. So this we didn't look at all, but it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Possibly because of the macro environment in a new uh, tissue, it will have an impact on the heterogeneity heterogeneity of the tumor. This we could look at. But what we know is that uh, you can induce tumors from uh, different neuroblasts, for example, neuroblasts in the brain, rather than neuroblasts in the ventral nerve cord, as we've uh, been uh, investigating. And here, the tumors will, uh, what we find is that they are still composed of the same type of cells, but not the same uh, proportions. Mm. So you may have more of these uh, red cells that we, we call uh, cancer stem cell-like uh, cells. So we have tumors that have much more of this. So in our case, we find about 20% of the cells are cancer stem cells. But uh, we also find uh, other type of tumors that have been induced in other regions of the brain, and they contain much more of these uh, cancer stem cells. And we don't know why. So this is also an interesting question to move. So depending on the cancer cell of origin, of the tumor cell of origin, you have a different composition of the tumor. And is this heterogeneity also um, um, a characteristic of a pediatric tumor in, in children? So I think it's just the beginning of understanding this question in, uh, in pediatric tumors. And, and really, uh, this is going now very fast thanks to a single cell uh, technology. An ASEC technology, and over the last um, one year and a half, there have been several papers showing that there is some heterogeneity. It's not clear yet what is uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, the function or the uh, biological significance of this uh, heterogeneity, whether it's important for tumor growth, for example. But uh, what has been shown also is that uh, this uh, heterogeneity, in fact, is uh, is due to the recapitulation of developmental programs. So it's very similar to what we found. But Thank we you. don't know yet how does it impact tumor growth and uh, yeah. Thank you, Simon. I think I think you have a question in the uh, Q and Okay, yes. So I have uh, Louise uh, Gritam. Very naive question, but which resolution of microscope do you use to see a thing so small? <laughs> Thanks for you. So, um, uh, which resolution? So, these cells are uh, about uh, uh, five to, to ten uh, micrometers uh, large. So, we use, you know, um, confocal microscopy, of course, uh, to look at this. Um, and I have to say that, uh, yeah, confocal microscopy and uh, so, of course, the brain of the Drosophila is very, is very small, so it, it's also an advantage because the tissue is, uh, is uh, very clear also. So we can use uh, confocal microscopy uh, for that, and, um, and we use the 20x or 40x uh, magnification uh, on, this, uh, on this microscope. So. Um, 
but compared to uh, yeah, it's uh, it's an advantage of um, maybe um, bigger bigger tumors um, in in mouse or I mean I think you can do the same with mice basically, but uh, it's maybe easier with Josephine. I have another question, uh, Kulgana. Do certain neuroblast population cause tumors more than others? Yes, it's a good question. And it's also a little bit related to what I was saying before. So depending on the neuroblast population of origin, you can have tumors, but that will have different uh, growth properties because they, are don't, they, don't, uh, they are not composed by the same, exactly the same proportion of cancer stem cells and differentiated cells. So, so the, the way the developmental program progresses into these tumors is, works differently depending on the, on the cancer cell of origin. And also we know that there are some neuroblasts uh, that can uh, amplify if you remove genes like Prospero, for example, but they will not form uh, tumors. And the reason for this is that because they are part of some regions of the brain, in which this whole developmental program is not really uh, operating. So, so um, they are not able to, uh, to, to, to propagate in adult stages. So all the neuroblasts will differentiate during uh, metamorphosis in these cases. So the, the cell of origin is really, really important and will really, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, determine uh, the type of tumor you will have at the end. Even if when you look at neuroblasts using a neuroblast marker, the neuroblasts look pretty similar. Geneviève Rougon, bonjour Geneviève. Uh, does the concept of temporal patterning you described also apply to other tissues? Um, good question. We think so. Also, um, um, so for example, in Drosophila, at least, what I can tell you is that we've found uh, some of these genes also to be expressed in other uh, type of tissues, for example, in, uh, in epithelial tissues, like in the wing disc, except that we don't really see this, um, uh, um, this rapid uh, sequential expression of transcription factors, but instead it looks like uh, it's more um, humoral cues like uh, steroid hormones that are responsible for making temporal transitions. So for example, we see uh, Chinmo being expressed um, in person clip or so, but it's uh, ecdison, so the steroid hormone that is doing the transition rather than uh, this sequential expression of transcription factors. So, so the base, there seems to be something that is a bit similar also, the, the mechanism that schedules the transition is not the same. Okay, if you have, uh, we have no more questions, we are going to thank uh, um, Cédric and, and the PhD students. Thanks all for your presence at this uh, first neurobinar. So we will uh, see you next month. Um, uh, we will see you on February 18th with uh, Pierre-Yves Jacob from LNC and Dominique Bingham from EINP. And again, thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you very you much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye.